Let's get ready to mortgage. He is the prince of programs, guru of guidelines, master of matrixes. He puts the fun in funding. Please welcome Mark, Mr. Mortgage, I tell. All right. My name is Mark Itell and you are listening to the Mr. Mortgage Show. And friends, you're in the right place. If you've got questions and you want answers about mortgage and real estate and who is not confused today, every headline seems to contradict the one in front of it. The data in the article contradicts the headline. And I don't know who you want to listen to on the news. Is there a recession coming? Are we in a recession? Is the housing market going to crash? Are things going to continue to appreciate? Where are interest rates going? Is all of this banking crisis going to encourage the Fed to slow down the interest rate hikes? Or is he going to keep charging ahead? Guys, we're going to cover all of that. We're going to answer your questions. We're going to give you the information that you need so you can go out there and make better real estate and mortgage decisions for you and your family. Again, my name is Mark Itell. This is the Mr. Mortgage Show. Guys, if you've got questions or comments, you can call or text 855-462-7292. That's 855-462-7292. If you prefer to shoot us an email, just visit mrmortgageradio.com. That's mrmortgageradio.com. Scroll to the bottom of the page, click on that email icon, and you can shoot your questions over that way. Jen, my producer, is womaning the hotline. She's running the board. She's looking out for emails and she'll get your questions on the air. Guys, and speaking of Jen and all of the ladies out there, we have just wrapped up Women's History Month. And before we start jumping into April Fool's jokes, I want to give the ladies their, their due and pay homage to women in real estate. And when I was putting my notes together for today's show, Women in Real Estate, I was talking with a colleague at the office and And they immediately went to successful lady real estate agents. That's where their mind went. And ironically enough, the vast majority of successful realtors that I work with and that are part of that really great agents network that we promote are indeed women. But that's not where I'm going with all of this. Women, single women in particular and versus single men, I wanted to look at that category in home ownership. And once again, single ladies are outpacing single men. It's traditionally the case. So it doesn't surprise me anymore, but I'm always fascinated by the numbers. So at the end of 2022, there were just under 11 million households owned by single women versus just over 8 million by single men. So wow, guys, The ladies are blowing the doors off the single guys out there. Guys, you need to tighten up. Maybe stop leasing those fancy cars and buying all of that Axe body spray and go out there and buy your first place. And interestingly enough, ladies are doing it with less money because there is a gender gap in wages and ladies tend to earn about 85% of the salary of the equivalent men in the same uh, job field. So, Not making this political, just throwing all the facts out there. The ladies are doing more while making less. And interestingly enough, ladies typically have a higher credit score. When we're evaluating a borrower and co-borrower, either boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, and wife, usually the ladies have a higher credit score. So they are doing something right. Kudos to the ladies. And uh, there are a lot of powerful women in my life. Jen, back there running the board is one. And I was raised in a single parent household by a very, very strong mom. So I want to give a shout out to my mom, who is still with us today and will call me from time to time, put me in line. But yeah, ladies are getting it done. So in celebration of Women's History Month, I wanted to throw that out there. One last stat I found fascinating, and this dates back to 2019. I couldn't find any more current data than this. But if it's out there and you have it available, shoot it to me. I'd love to see it. But they looked at the net worth growth in single women over a 30-year period. So in 1989, the average net worth of a single woman in the country was 142000 which honestly surprised me. I thought that was a high number for back in 1989. But in 2019, that number was $267,000. Now, this may or may not surprise you, but the largest share of that net worth was equity wealth, right? So we all know what's happened to real estate values since 2019. They've exploded, doubled in a lot of instances. So 
that net worth number by default has grown considerably. So guys, guys, if you're out there at happy hour and she owns a house, pay close attention to that lady because she's doing something right and she probably has a larger net worth than you. But anyway, that equity wealth piece of the story got me thinking. And I want to share a quick story with you about a recent client. His name is Jeff. So single guy here. He's one of the 8 million out there getting it done. But he came to us originally back in 2020 and was buying his first home. And he purchased a starter home for $280,000. Now, here's the cool thing. Just a short three years later, that home is worth $430,000. Now, here's the cool thing. He's doing a cash out refinance, pulling equity out of the property, putting his original down payment back in the bank and taking the rest of the money and putting it down on a $500,000 house. So he's moving up. And that $500,000 house is a fixer upper. So he's going to go in there and roll up his sleeves, throw some sweat and effort into the property and bump his equity position right out of the box. So this guy has figured out how to get it done. But here's the really cool thing, guys. He's going to own two properties. One, he's keeping that original property as a rental. So someone else is going to be paying down that debt. He's going to have a positive cash position on that property. Now, granted, not a ton of profit, but he is going to have a positive cash position. Someone else is paying the debt down while the property is building equity. And he's going to own a much larger home. It's he, his girlfriend, and her two kids now. So they got a bigger family. And he's doing all of that with none, zero of his own saved money. He put his down payment down on the first property. He's now pulled that back out, stuck it in the bank, and he's putting money down from the equity of the first property on the second property. So he is house hacking his way to an investment portfolio. And guys, with what's going on out there in the banking world, a lot of people are looking to real estate as a safe haven. And this is a guy who's doing it without a big pile of cash. He's not a big portfolio investor in real estate. He's just moving up and his goal is to every three to five years, make a move that will enable him to keep the current property and go buy another property. And he's a young guy. He's in his late twenties. So over time, he's, he's going to build up a significant portfolio of properties using this strategy. And guys, this strategy sometimes is referred to as BRRR, B-R-R-R-R. And that stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. And he's doing it a little bit differently because he, these are primary residents that he's going to use to step up the ladder of home ownership. But I wanted to share that story because so many people get just befuddled by the headlines and they turtle in and they say, now's not the right time. But guys, properties are still appreciating And it almost always makes sense to own over rent. And I say almost always because there are instances where it's not a wise move. And I'm not an advocate of blindly going out there and buying real estate, but I am an advocate of people who are able to buy and they've got the means to do it, to put themselves in the position to build that equity. And and Jeff's story kind of solidifies how you can do that. And the women in the earlier part of the story indicate how they're already out there getting it done. But guys, you hear the music, you know what that means. That is my cue. We'll be back in a few. Sit tight on the other side of this break. We'll be back with more of the Mr. Mortgage Show. We'll be right back. Let me tell you a little story about a man named Jed. Well, this is not a story about Jed, but it is a story about Mary. Mary is an awesome single mom who's been raising her daughter in a one-bedroom, one-bath apartment for the last 11 years. That's right, one bedroom and one bath. Hey, they've made the best of it. They've got bunk beds in there and it's worked. But her daughter's now a teenager and it's becoming a challenge, especially sharing that bathroom. She decided to jump in and become a homeowner. We got her approved with an FHA loan. That's right. I said it, FHA. Hey, if your agent's telling you FHA and VA loans are not getting accepted, you are working with the wrong agent. Contact me and I'll get you in touch with a really great agent. Hey, but back to Mary. She jumped in and she is now a proud homeowner. They have their own bedrooms, but more importantly, their own baths. They couldn't be happier. Guys, if you'd like to learn more, check out MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. My name is Mark Itell, NMLS 1929005. Check us out at MrMortgageRadio.com. 
Welcome back to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Call us now at 855-462-7292. All right, we are back. My name is Mark Itell, and you are tuned into the Mr. Mortgage Show. And we open the show talking about Women's History Month and celebrating how much more productive women are when it comes to owning real estate, building equity wealth, and managing their credit on less money, by the way. And I forgot I was going to sing that Beyonce song, all the single ladies, all the single ladies, (laughs) put your hands up. (laughs) Jen's back there shaking her head. How about, what is it? Sisters are doing it for them. (laughs) Okay. Okay. She is, I can't tell you how she's signaling me to stop, but guys, if you have questions or comments, call or text 855-462-7292. That's the anytime hotline, 855 462-7292. And Jen will get your questions on the air. Again, if you prefer to do that via email, just visit mrmortgageradio.com. That's mrmortgageradio.com and click on the email icon. You can send your questions that way. So anyway, I'm going to throw it over to Jen for uh, question number one. What do you have, Jen? Colleen is asking this question. I don't really understand mortgage insurance, but I know I need it. My question is, can I shop for it like my homeowner's insurance? If yes, can I get it from the same insurance company I use to buy my home insurance? Thank you. Hey, Colleen, that's a great question. Sadly, the answer to that question is no, you typically are not able to shop for it. And the reason is that it's arranged by the lender and the mortgage insurance doesn't benefit you in any way other than loans with mortgage insurance allow you to put less than 20% down. So the mortgage insurance insures the lender on the amount of money over 80% that they're loaning you. So should you go into foreclosure, the lender can use that insurance policy to mitigate some of their loss. So, but great, great question. And when you're reviewing your mortgage quote, and if you're comparing quotes, make sure you look at that number because Uh, Mortgage insurance can vary from lender to lender. There aren't a bunch of mortgage insurance companies out there, so the rates usually aren't wildly different, but you do want to pay attention to that number. And fun fact, guys, if you're looking at your mortgage quote, double check the numbers for taxes, for homeowners insurance, and for mortgage insurance, because if your lender is not disclosing the actual taxes or the actual insurance, because sometimes, especially with the online lenders, they're guesstimating because taxes can vary wildly from county to county or city to city or township to township. So you want to make sure who's ever quoted that is using your actual tax amount based on your purchase price, not the current owner. That's another big place that people get wrapped around the axle using a real insurance number And mortgage insurance is something that you're going to want to pay attention to. But to answer your question, it's not something that you can shop for. However, it is something that you want to pay attention to. So great, great question. I appreciate that. And a lot of people don't pay enough attention to that number. So I appreciate you pointing that out. And uh, great, great question. Hey, Jen, do we have another question? Noah wants to know. We're in the middle of buying a house. We just got the appraisal and the value is 12000 higher than our contract price. Can we increase the price by 12000 and use it to buy down the rate and costs? Hey, Noah, that's another great question. And, you know, typically it's the other way around, right? The appraisal doesn't hit the number that you want it to. In this case, it exceeded it. So, so to answer your question, yes. So you want to make sure the appraisal has been reviewed and accepted by the underwriter because it just hitting the number is awesome. But there is another step after the appraisal is received. It has to be reviewed and they look at things like the comparable sales, the adjustments made, the age of the sales and the amount of the adjustments to make sure that it meets the required guidelines. So assuming all of that's been done, you should be able to increase the sales price and write an addendum to the contract and then use that additional money for the contribution to the buyer. And I think you're the buyer in this equation to help pay for your closing costs. Now there's a few caveats. 
there are percentages of the contract price that a seller contribution can't exceed, and that's based on the different loan programs. So I would need to know more to make sure that it would work for your particular scenario. But as a general practice, you can increase the sales price to the appraisal amount and then use that additional money as a seller contribution. And people are doing that and using that contribution to buy the rate down to pay closing costs for a lot of things. Did you know that with some loan programs, you can use seller proceeds to pay off debt that the buyer has. So here's an example. Let's say a buyer has a big credit card balance on their visa card and it's got a big payment. And because of that payment, they don't qualify for the loan when the debt to income ratio is being evaluated. So guys, if you've listened to the show before, we've talked about debt to income and DTI, the percentage of your gross income that can be used for debt is calculated as a percentage. Well, with certain loan programs, the seller contribution can be used to pay off that Visa card, and then that payment is no longer included in the debt-to-income ratio. So a seller contribution is a powerful tool for a lot of things. It can be used for prepaids, it can be used for closing costs, or now one of the more popular strategies to use that money for an interest rate buy-down. So Noah, that was a great question, my man. And in theory, that should work, but I would need to know a few more details before I could give you a really good answer. Because as I mentioned, there are percentages that can't be exceeded. um, And I would need to know the purchase price. I would need to know what loan program that you are using to buy the property. And with that data, I could give you a better answer. But great, great question. And congratulations on buying a property that is over appraising right because that's a that's a a rare thing in in today's market so that's awesome but guys you hear the music you know what that means that's my cue we'll be back in a few sit tight on the other side of this break we'll be back with more of the mr mortgage show so you think interest rates have gotten too high to refi well not so fast there are several reasons people refinance sure lowering your interest rate is one but there's debt consolidation home improvement, unexpected medical expenses, pulling out some equity to go buy an investment property. Heck, I even know of one guy who refinanced his house so he could buy his mistress a condo. But let's jump back to debt consolidation for a minute. I'm working with a client right now. His name is Ben. He's going to refinance his house, pay off a host of credit cards and two truck payments. And yes, his mortgage interest rate is going to go up, but his monthly expenses are going to go down significantly. And that monthly savings is going to get he and his family back on track. Guys, if you've got questions, check us out at MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. My name is Mark Itell, NMLS 1929005. I host the Mr. Mortgage Show, and we are always here and happy to help. Check us out at MrMortgageRadio.com. Welcome back to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Call us now at 855-462-7292. All right, we are back. My name is Mark Itell, and you are tuned into the Mr. Mortgage Show. Friends, if you've got questions or comments, just call or text 855-462-7292. That is the Anytime Hotline, 855 855- Four six two seven two nine two. Jen is standing by, womaning the hotline, and she'll get your questions on the air. One more time for the kids in the back: eight five five four six two seven two nine two, or just visit mrmortgageradio.com. That's mrmortgageradio.com. Scroll to the bottom of the page, click on that email icon, and you can send your questions over that way. And I promise, no more singing, guys. If you missed the last segment of the show. I was singing to the ladies, but Jen's made me promise, at least for today, no more songs. So anyhow, speaking of Jen and your questions, as they are my favorite part of the show, let's keep your questions rolling. Hey, Jen, are you ready with another? Okay, go ahead. Lucas sent this one. Last week, you talked about renegotiating a mortgage quote. What fees are negotiable? The bank is telling me they're giving me the best deal. (laughs) I appreciate your advice. I had to chuckle only because, of course, the bank is telling you they're giving you the very best deal, and they may be. It's hard for me to answer this question without seeing your fee sheet, 
but I'm happy to look at it. You guys know that we offer that service. We're always happy to review a fee sheet if you've got questions. But Lucas, I would look at things like origination points, discount points, any lender fees, anything that's being paid to the lender or the mortgage brokerage company. And I would start there. Now, keep in mind that things like origination fee or discount points or origination points, they may be correlated to your interest rate. So lowering that fee may increase your interest rate. Not always, but sometimes those fees are associated with buying a lower rate. So just keep that in mind. But it's certainly your right to ask questions and to push back if you feel like you're being charged for things that don't make sense. Now, if you're in a state that closes with a title company or a title attorney, there might be some wiggle room in some of their fees. I would need to know a little bit more about your purchase contract and take a look at that fee sheet to give you a really good answer. But I would start with the lender fees and anything that looks like an admin fee or a transaction fee, I would I would take a look at that. So I hope that answers your question. And Noah, you know, if you want us to review that fee sheet, just contact me and let me know and we'll give you instructions on how to get that done. I appreciate that question. Hey, Jen, what else do we have? Ava has this question. I have a weird question. Uh oh. All of my bank accounts are joint accounts with my mom. This is so I can help her manage her expenses. I'm ready to buy a house and wondering if this is going to be a problem for me. Okay, that's not as weird as uh, I thought it was going to be. That shouldn't be a problem. So it's not uncommon to see this circumstance where there are joint bank accounts with either another family member and sometimes a non-family member. And typically what needs to be done, especially if the money needed for the transaction is coming out of that joint account, typically all that's required is a letter from the other party stating that you have full and free access to all the funds. So if you had a letter of explanation stating what you just shared with us, that this is a joint account, but I have access to all of these funds and can use them at my discretion, and mom signs off on that letter... Uh, That's usually all that's necessary. There could be a couple nuances. I would need to know a little bit more, but that should give you a general idea that you most likely can move forward without an issue. And we see it a lot with boyfriend, girlfriend, right? Not a husband and wife, but a boyfriend and girlfriend might have a joint account and they live as if they're married and we'll have a letter from one party to the other. And that that's usually all we need to get through the underwriting process. But another great question, and I would encourage anybody out there who is thinking they might be facing something that's going to prohibit them from, you know, getting a, a loan approval, just have the conversation. Call us if you don't have somebody that you're already working with. We'll be happy to walk you through it because oftentimes what appears to be a weird question or an insurmountable hurdle is something that we can work around. We talked about it a few shows ago with that, you know, three-legged versus four-legged stool. If you've got good credit, but not a lot of income and you've got a lot of assets, there are ways to work around that. Or you don't have the assets, but you've got the income and the credit. There are programs for that. A 100% loan program doesn't always need to be some type of low-income housing grant. There are a lot of opportunities for homeownership right now. So I just wanted to throw that out there to encourage you because oftentimes what people think is an insurmountable hurdle is something that we can work around. But I appreciate that question. I hope that answer helped. And as always, if you need more info, please feel free to reach out. I'll be happy to go deeper with you. Hey, Jen, do you have another question? Kristen sent us this text. How fast, from start to finish, does a mortgage take? I had an approval, but my bank is now telling me they can't approve my loan. I have to close by the 17th of next month. Is this achievable? Can your company help? Thanks so much. Wow, that is a great question. So let me start by saying the 17th of next month is definitely doable, especially if you've got all your paperwork together and you are ready to hit the ground running. I like to say we drive the bus, but it's your foot that's on the accelerator and on the brake pedal. It's up to you how fast we go. We can move as fast 
as a client can provide us documentation. So yes, the 17th of next month is achievable, especially if the appraisals already been completed, because that is a significant time component to the average transaction. Assuming that appraisal is done and we can get that transferred over, that timeline's not an issue. But here's what I'm super curious about. Why all of a sudden are they saying that you're no longer approved? Did something in your credit profile change? Did you miss a credit card payment or a car payment and your credit score is now dropped and you no longer qualify for the program? Is there something going on with your job or your income? Is that the reason why? I'd need to know a lot more about the type of loan that you're applying for. Uh, Is it a self-employed borrower situation and somebody miscalculated the income on the tax returns? Because we don't use that bottom line taxable income for the typical self-employed borrower. We can add back a lot of write-offs to fairly represent what your income actually is. Not all write-offs, don't get excited, but you know, paper losses, depreciation, things like that can be added back. So is it an overlay or a guideline? Because guys, the guidelines are issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA. Those are the, the rules, if you will, that need to be met for a loan to be sold under the guise of conventional or FHA financing. Overlays are sometimes put in place by individual banks or lenders as temporary, more restrictive guidelines, usually because they want to balance their portfolio. They no longer want a lot of FHA loans or USDA loans or townhouses or condos, so they may drop an overlay in place, and we saw a lot of that during COVID. But that being said, I'd love a shot at it. I'd love to dig in and see if there's something we can do because you do have time. So yeah, if you're interested, let's talk off the air and we'll see if we can't make something happen. But guys, you hear the music, you know what that means. That's my cue. We'll be back in a few. Sit tight on the other side of this break. We'll be back with more of the show. Raise your hand if you are freaked out by what's happening in the banking world. Well, no, no, put your hands back on the steering wheel. It's all starting to feel like a house of cards. And what about that 17 billion, yes, billion with a B, dollars worth of bondholder money that was lost in that Credit Suisse takeover? Right now, I'm hearing more and more people talk about a flight to safety, and they're looking at gold and silver and other precious metals, but also rental property. Yep, income-producing rental property is starting to become sexy again. Guys, we've got an amazing loan program called the Landlord Loan. It's an easy way to acquire rental property. If you've got good credit and the assets, we don't even look at your personal income. We look at the income produced by the property. Assuming that it supports the debt, boom, you're a landlord. Check us out at MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. My name is Mark Itell, NMLS 1929005. And my team and I are here and happy to help. Check us out at MrMortgageRadio.com. Welcome back to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Call us now at 855-462-7292. All right, we are back. My name is Mark Itell, and you are tuned into the Mr. Mortgage Show. Guys, you got questions or comments, just call or text 855-462-7292. That's 855-462-7292. Or if you prefer to shoot your questions via email, just visit MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. Scroll to the bottom of the page. Click on that email icon and you can shoot your questions over to Jen that way. She is standing by womaning the hotline and the email line and running the board back there. She is running crazy back there today. We've got a lot of activity, but she'll get your questions on the air. Uh, But yeah, call or text or shoot us an email. But anyway, speaking to Jen, speaking of your questions, let's keep them coming. Hey, Jen, you got another question ready? Okay. What do you have? Jamie is asking. Is there a way to get an idea whether I can qualify for a mortgage without pulling my credit? Everyone wants to check my credit, but I'm not quite ready, and I don't want to hurt my score. I have credit karma and have good credit scores. Thank you. Oh, oh, oh. 
Jamie's texting. <laughs> I promised I wasn't going to sing, but I couldn't help myself. Man, I am a horrible singer, guys. <laughs> anyway, great, great question. Yes, so there are different variations, right? You hear the term pre-qualified, pre-approved, and then, you know, AUS, DU, or LP approval. Those are kind of the three different stages. So pre-qualified, most of the time pre-qualified is non-verified information, just letting you know that you meet the general guidelines for a program. So certainly your Credit Karma score, while not wildly accurate in the world of mortgages, gives you a pretty good idea of is your score in the range it needs to be. So you know, if your credit karma is an 815, well, you're going to be okay because a mortgage in, a mortgage credit score is typically lower, but it's not going to be, a, you know, a 620. There's not that much variation in it. So if you've got your credit karma information and you're comfortable disclosing your income, your assets, and your debt, then most of the time that's going to be enough to, to determine whether you're pre-qualified. Now, If you're starting to write contracts, usually a pre-qualification isn't enough for the seller to feel comfortable enough to take the house off the market. Because as I mentioned, that pre-qualification, and I air quoted qualification, is usually non-verified information. You know, you could just call and do it verbally. Now, a pre-approval is all verified information and the mortgage credit score, mortgage credit report in the file. And that's going to be a hard inquiry. Now, the good news is a mortgage score doesn't typically move your credit score down significantly. Usually it's less than 10 points, often around two or three points. And the reason is that a mortgage usually is replacing existing obligations. So it's not like more debt. It's just different debt. So you're either currently paying a mortgage or you're currently paying rent and you're going to replace that monthly payment with a mortgage where if you open another credit card or you finance something at one of the big box stores or a furniture store, that's adding to your debt load. So usually those credit inquiries impact your score more significantly. And I just want you to be aware of that because to get a bona fide approval, you are going to need someone to pull your credit. Now, most mortgage companies, we do this, they have what's called a soft pull. A soft pull gives us access to your report and to your bona fide mortgage score, but it's not a hard inquiry. It's the system that a big credit card company might use when they send you a pre-approved offer. They've looked at your credit profile and you meet the requirements. It's not a hard inquiry. That's going to lower your score. So <clears throat> that soft pull will usually give the mortgage company company enough information to, to give you good insight whether you're going to qualify or not. But to get that bona fide approval, you're going to need a, a mortgage credit report to go through the full underwriting process. So guys, pre-qualification, non-verified information that lets you know you meet the general parameters for a program. Pre-approval, information's verified and a hard credit inquiry has been executed and that report is in the file. Everything looks good. You're not going to have a problem. AUS approval, AUS stands for Automated Underwriting System. And that's what issues the DU, desktop underwriter, and LP. And those initials are just the difference between Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's approval engine. But AUS approval means all of the information has been verified. It's been entered into the underwriting engine and an approved eligible has been spit out. So those are the three uh, levels of qualification to approval on a conventional FHA or VA loan. But going all the way back to your question, there is a way to get a very good idea if you're going to be approved without a hard credit inquiry lowering your credit score. But keep in mind, a mortgage inquiry doesn't significantly lower your score. So it's a brilliant, brilliant question. I appreciate that. I hope it helps. But let me toss it over to Jen for another question. Joshua sent this one. I started working with an agent, but I'm not sure he is the right person for me. 
Am I obligated to pay him anything for his work so far? I'm ready to switch to an agent I know from my church. We have looked at a few homes, but haven't made any offers. Hey, Joshua, that is a great question and a super awkward place to be, right? I get it. But typically, if you've not signed an exclusive agency agreement where you agree to pay a fee to the agent that you've been working with, you should be able to transition without cost. Now, that being said, you want to make sure that there wasn't a fee agreement in place prior to that or the fee agreement specified that their commission was earned and payable at closing, which is typical. And it's an awkward situation. It happens from time to time. But I would suggest at least having the conversation with the first agent. Don't ghost them. I mean, it sounds like they've been putting in the effort. You've been looking at properties. And sometimes, guys, even if the agent is super capable, it might just be a personality thing. And you might feel like you're a better fit with the other person. So I understand the the desire to switch gears in the middle. And usually the agreement specifies that you're only going to work with that particular agent and that their fee is earned at closing. And if that's the case, there might be some type of document required to release them or that you agree to notify them that you're switching gears. And then if you're going to buy a property that they've already showed you, There might be a little bit of an issue there. There's a thing called procuring cause. So just know that if you've looked at properties and you have no interest in looking at them again with the new agent, then I would imagine you're okay. But guys, I'm not a real estate attorney. I would recommend having the conversation and just not ghosting them. Because as I mentioned, it does sound like they put the effort in and you were You were looking at properties and maybe this is just not a fit from a personality standpoint, but I'm a big advocate of picking an agent that you have full faith and confidence in and sticking with that person. Um, You know, we have access to the really great agent network. If anybody out there needs an awesome agent and you haven't found them yet in your personal circle, give us a call. We can get you in touch with someone. I know that you've already found somebody from your church, which is awesome. And if you've got a better rapport with them, it makes total sense to switch gears. But as I mentioned, just pay that person the professional courtesy of letting them know. And there might be a release document that they need to put in the file to just, you know, specify that the relationship is now over and they're no longer representing you. And a lot of people don't realize that, that the buyer's agents only get paid if you buy something. But that is a great question. I appreciate it. I know it's awkward. Um, It does happen. And uh, I'm sure everybody involved will understand. Just, you know, be above board. Let them know that you're switching gears. And if you need more information, if you have that discussion and you think, wait a minute, I want to run this by somebody, give me a call. At very least, I'll refer you to somebody that can answer the questions in more detail. But you hear the music. You know what that means. That's my cue. We'll be back in a few. Sit tight. On the other side of this break, we'll be back with more of the Mr. Mortgage Show. Have you recently gotten a mortgage approval and now you're wondering, how do you know if it's a good deal? I mean, the wrong decision can cost tens of thousands of dollars in fees and interest rate. Is any of this negotiable? Is this a good rate? Guys, it's Mark Itell, host of the Mr. Mortgage Show, and we are happy at no cost or obligation to you to take a look at that fee sheet for you. We'll go line by line through it and one of three things will happen. One, we may congratulate you on getting an awesome deal and then you can exhale and move forward knowing you did great. Or two, we may be able to point out some places in that fee sheet that you can go back and renegotiate a better deal with your current lender. Or three, and guys, this one's my favorite, we may be able to offer you even a better deal, saving you in fees or interest rate or both. Guys, there's no obligation. Just go to MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. Click on that fee sheet review icon and we'll do the rest. It's Mark Itell, NMLS 1929005. Welcome back to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Call us now at 855-462-7292. 
All right, we are back. My name is Mark Itell, and you are listening to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Guys, if you've got questions or comments, just call or text 855-462-7292. That's 855-462-7292. Jen is womaning the Anytime Hotline, and she'll get you on the air. And you can also visit MrMortgageRadio.com, MrMortgageRadio.com. Scroll to the bottom of the page. Click that email icon and shoot your questions over via email if you prefer. But guys, we've had some great questions so far. Man, oh man, it's been an awesome, awesome show so far. We started off celebrating the women. I snuck in a couple of songs, much to the chagrin of Jen. (laughs) Nobody likes it when I sing. Hey, fun fact, guys, I play the drums in a rock and roll band. It's kind of a 70s and 80s rock band. We just kind of get together in a warehouse studio, but they will not put mics anywhere we're near the drums. This is the only time I get to sit behind the microphone because clearly I am not a singer. I'm a talker, but not a singer. But speaking of talking, let's keep talking about your questions. Jen, do we have another question? Okay, let's go. Kyle is asking, am I able to get a mortgage in my company's name? I want to buy a couple investment properties with my company. Hey, Kyle, that's a great question. So, Yes, you can. There are loan programs. We talk about the landlord loan all the time. That loan will allow you to close in the name of a company. And oftentimes, even if people don't have a company already operating for the purpose of acquiring real estate, they'll often acquire real estate in the name of a newly formed LLC. So it doesn't have to be a pre-existing company with company credit history. It just in the case of the landlord loan, needs to be a property that meets the guidelines. We underwrite you personally for your credit and for your assets, but we're looking at the property for the income. And that's the landlord loan. That can close in the name of a company. Also, SBA loans typically will require that the qualifying company create an LLC as a holding company for the real estate and they'll close the SBA loan in the name of the holding company. We've done that several, several times. And in that instance, it's less about a hierarchy of corporate protection and more about the business leasing the property at no profit back from the LLC. But I don't want to take this off topic with SBA guidelines. If anybody has questions regarding acquiring commercial property, like an office building, a warehouse complex, a strip mall, those type of properties using an SBA loan, I'm happy to have those conversations. We had an interesting question a couple weeks ago uh, from a couple who were wanting to move to Florida and acquire an RV park and retire there and run the RV park as their retirement in paradise. And that's achievable with an SBA loan. That particular property, as I recall, might've also been eligible for a USDA loan. But anyway, to answer your question, I'm getting off track guys. I geek out on this stuff and I love, love, love talking about it. But yes, there are several loan programs that will allow you to close in the name of a company, but Hey, let's keep your questions rolling. Jen, can you throw me another one? Donnie sent this one. If we agree to give a buyer money towards their costs and the house appraisal comes back low, are we still on the hook for the contribution? Hey, Donnie, that's a great question. And we had an appraisal issue earlier in the show where it came in higher than the contract price. So typically in real estate, certainly if there's a mortgage involved, we're looking at the sales price or the appraised value, whichever's less. So in that instance, if the property didn't appraise, then the loan amount and everything is going to be based on the lower amount. Usually it's written in the contract that it's required to appraise at that higher number. And if it's not there, that certainly won't cause an issue to add an addendum, just clarifying that so everybody's comfortable. But usually on the mortgage side of things, it's going to cause a problem. So to answer your question, make sure it's documented, but you're not going to be expected to pay that additional money if it indeed is called out, documented, and everybody's on the same page because certainly you're not going to want to pay a contribution towards the buyer's 
closing costs or rate buy down if the property doesn't appraise. But brilliant, brilliant question. We get that one a lot, but just make sure it's clearly spelled out and you should be fine. If you need some help with that, or you want me to review some documents or refer you to somebody, just call me off the air and I'll be happy to walk through it with you. But let's keep your questions rolling. Jen, can we get an, okay, what do we have? Judy has a question. What happens if we take a reverse mortgage and property values crash? Do we have to pay it off? Thank you. Hey, that is a brilliant, brilliant question. And guys, I promise one of these weeks we're going to dive into reverse mortgages because in my personal practice, we're getting more and more questions regarding reverse mortgages because fixed income seniors, oftentimes the only place you have to turn is to your equity. And that reverse mortgage allows you to stay in the property and live on the equity that you have in the home without having to make a monthly mortgage payment. So I know there are always a ton of questions. This is one of them. And the, gr- the great news in this instance is, well, the great news is I don't think there's a crash coming, not anytime soon, but assuming that there is a crash, you don't have to give the money back. You don't have to pay the loan off early. The reverse mortgage is an FHA loan product that has the loss of the lender insured. So you pay for the insurance as part of your closing costs. Remember, we talked about mortgage insurance earlier. It's much like that. But because of that, the loss to the lenders insured, that property can go to zero and you can live in it until your death. So brilliant, brilliant question. A couple of other things people have a lot of questions around with the reverse mortgages. What happens to my heirs? Well, they inherit the property and there's a lien on the property, just like any other mortgage. They can sell the property, and if there's positive equity, they're going to take that money and split it amongst the heirs, or they can refinance it into their name. It operates exactly like any other mortgaged real estate that passes to the heirs. So it's still your house. The bank doesn't own your house. They can't kick you out. Now, you do have to make sure the the property's insured, maintained, and that you pay your taxes because a reverse mortgage can foreclose if those items aren't kept up to date. So just be aware of that. It's not an instance where the bank's going to push you out if the value um, drops. So brilliant, brilliant question. I appreciate it. Hey, Jen, can we get one more in? Okay. What do we have? George sent this one. Can I get a regular mortgage on a house with open permits? My friend ran out of money on a major remodel and I want to buy the house and finish the work. Is this even possible? That is a fantastic question. And the answer is most likely. (laughs) I would need to know a lot more. Um, There are several loan programs available for fix and flip properties. If you're going to treat this purely as an investment, there are a load of programs available to buy a property as a primary residence that needs rehab. That's out there also. And then if you're going to buy this property and you as the borrower or the property doesn't meet the parameters for one of those loans I just mentioned, There is, in some instances, it doesn't happen often, but we've done it before, where we've had a builder's risk insurance policy put in place in front of a homeowner's insurance policy, which makes everybody, which which protects the lender, protects the insurance company, and gives you the time to finish the rehab. But it all depends on what's left to be done and what your intent is with the property. So not a clear answer, I know, but I would love to have a deeper discussion with you about this off the air because I do think there are a few strategies that might work for you. Brilliant question. I appreciate it. Man, we've had some great ones this week. I hope everybody had fun. You hear the music, you know what that means. We have come to the end of another round of the Mr. Mortgage Show. Guys, if you need us during the week, just visit MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. Or give us a call, 855-462-7292. Jen and I will be back next week right here, same time, same station. Have an awesome week. 
Hey, it's Mark Itell, host of the Mr. Mortgage Show. And why do I hate the word sales associated with real estate mortgages? Guys, my job is not to sell you anything. I'm not trying to convince you to buy a house or to refinance a house. What I am trying to do is help you make the very best real estate and mortgage decisions after you've decided it's something you want to do. Guys, think of me as the trainer in the gym. You've already decided that you want to get healthy. You are committed and then you engage that trainer. That trainer's not standing out in front of the ice cream shop trying to convince people to get healthy. Guys, I'm here. I'm happy to help. I'll answer any questions you have and I'll help you get it over the finish line, whether you're trying to acquire that very first house or the next office building. Guys, I've been doing it for a long time. I love what I do and I'm happy to help. Check us out at MrMortgageRadio.com. Again, it's MrMortgageRadio.com. It's Mark Itell, NMLS 1929005.